You're all very, very welcome to this Arts and Humanities Open Evening. My name is Gillian Pye and I'm Associate Dean for undergraduate students here in the College of Arts and Humanities at UCD. And this evening, um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about studying Arts and Humanities. I'm going to talk for a while about why you might want to study Arts and Humanities and just give you a general bit of information about our programmes. And then you'll also have the opportunity to meet some of our students. And I hope that some of the information that we can give you this evening is going to be useful. So I want to begin by thinking about why you might want to study Arts and Humanities. The world is changing very quite quickly. And I think that it is more important than ever before that we train students in arts and humanities subjects. And um, what I want to do is to kind of count you down uh, hit parade style and give you the three main reasons why I think it's a really good idea to study arts and humanities. So starting at number three, quite simply, an arts and humanities education is going to give you transferable skills that are going to take you into the future. And I can show you some interesting things there. Did you know, looking at this graphic here, you can see that by 2025, um, more than 50% of all day-to-day -day tasks in the workplace are going to be done by machines. There are already many tasks are being done by machines and that's only going to increase. So that means that the world of work is changing very, very rapidly. And the graduates of the future are going to need to be able to respond very rapidly to that. Quite clearly, we cannot possibly work like machines. We shouldn't try to imitate machines. What we need to do is to be really good at being human. And arts and humanities graduates are particularly well placed to do that. They're particularly well placed to be flexible and resilient in the workplace. And that is by, um, for some people, the definition of employability nowadays. So if you take a look at the top skills, and this is um, the World Economic Forum report from 2020, looking at the top skills that are going to be needed in the workplace as we go forward in the next few years. And when you look at them, you can see that most of them relate to um, very human uh, skills, human skill set, the capacity to deal with complexity and to interact with others. So you have things like analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, leadership and influence, resilience and flexibility. And I argue that these kinds of skills are all being actively and they're being explicitly developed as part of a contemporary holistic arts and humanities education. And to explain a, a bit more concretely there what I mean, um, Here's a list of the kinds of skills that arts and humanities students are learning when they're studying subjects like English, like uh, languages, like music. So they're doing things, for example, like using a whole range of different kinds of information sources, libraries, archives, online media, and they're learning to carry out research and then to organize and analyze the information that they've gathered. Um, what's really important and I think really exciting as well about an arts and humanities education is that it helps students to, to manage complexity and ambiguity. We live in a really, really complex world now. It's only getting more complicated and very often there aren't any black and white answers. Sometimes there aren't any answers at all. And that's when arts and humanities students really come into their own because they are able to deal with that kind of complexity. And again, that's a very, very human skill. Um, all Wizards Arts and Humanities students have been valued for their strong communication skills. And I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that from our um, students and our former students later on. Um, and we are still training oral skills in presentations. We're still training written skills in, in traditional ways, in essays and that kind of thing. But these days, Arts and Humanities students do a lot more than just write essays. They use the whole range of digital tools to express themselves. So they make videos, they make podcasts, they use visual tools, for example, like e-posters or digital pin boards to, to kind of present and to get across their ideas. And of course, that's, that's very creative. And I've already said creativity is a very important thing. Lateral thinking makes you flexible and it makes you adaptable. And it also makes, of course, for very persuasive um, and appealing 
communication and being able to persuade and influence is a really, really important skill. Um, you can kind of gather from, from what I'm saying that a lot of what arts and humanities students do happens um, as much outside the classroom as it does inside the classroom. So learning to manage your own time is very, very important. And our graduates tend to be very independent thinkers and very self-motivated workers. They do a lot of project work as well in groups sometimes and sometimes alone on and off campus. Um, they collab collaborate on, on shared presentations, on, on assignments, and sometimes they collaborate as well in multidisciplinary teams. And, and that's a very important thing too. So this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of skills that students are developing in arts and humanities degrees, um, which are going to speak to jobs of the future that are going to deal with the kind of complexity that machines can't manage. And I think that's very important. So that was number three, and I'm moving on now to number two. Number two is that, as I've already indicated, arts and humanities is about more than what happens inside the classroom. Arts and humanities um, subjects and degrees encourage you to add value within the programme and also alongside your module. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that as well as getting your specific training in your discipline, whether it's history or film or drama or literature, arts and humanities students tend to be actively engaged in using their skills in other hands-on activities that develop their profiles further. So that happens in student societies, for example, um, in extracurricular activities. Um, so students might write for newspapers, they might create social media, content, they might take part in debates or produce radio shows, they might campaign on social issues, they might volunteer in the community or play in an orchestra or act in a theatre play, fundraise, organise events, all kinds of things um, like this are happening on our very creative campus. You can see there in the top um, of the slide a picture of our creative campus where there's an awful lot of stuff going on to get involved with. And that's really, really important. I mean, it's fun and it's a great way of getting to know people, but it's also really important because it allows each individual to really build up their own profile that consolidates their education and it, it brings people into the outside world. And I think when we um, talk to our students later on, we'll see that um, being reflected again. Um, another thing I think that's really, really important and I want to emphasise uh, in today's talk is the opportunity that our degrees give students to spend some time in another country. Um, all of our BA degrees allow an opportunity for uh, a year or a semester abroad. In the languages programme, International Modern Languages, that's actually an integral part of the degree as well. And we have a lot of partner institutions, over 400 partner institutions worldwide. So this is, I think, a really um, great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to um, learn something about the world and about other people, but also to learn something about yourself. And that's something, um, this is very close to my heart because I am a modern languages specialist. I'm, I work in the German department when I'm not being associate dean so I can really see the benefit that this brings to students and I wanted to share with you a picture of some of my students that makes me smile. Um, this is a group of students on um, in, uh, an international experience when we went on a trip to the EU institutions and we stayed in Leuven. You can see a beautiful building in, in Leuven behind the students there and the joy on their faces is, is, is really very real, that experience of being abroad in a new place, experiencing uh, new things and meeting new people. It's a fantastic part of any education and art students are encouraged actively to take all of the opportunities that they can to spend time abroad. The other thing that I want to, to, to mention as well is um, the internship um, programme that we offer, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on when I come to talk about um, DN530 BA Humanities. I want to say um, at this point that I think that the things I'm talking about now, the experiences students have outside the classroom, the opportunity to go abroad, um, that's the reason why our students go into so many really, really interesting careers. And you can see them there on the screen, all of these different areas media and journalism, arts and culture, government and the public sector. And we've got some representatives uh, to talk to you today who've had these experiences. But just um, 
before you have a chance to meet them, um, I'd like to kind of show you a couple of profiles so that you can see what students go on to do. Here's Afric uh, Connolly, who works in marketing and communications. Uh, she's a communications manager with Kellogg's Europe. And she said to us that um, she really feels that when she's working in her job, when she's writing press releases, she's using the skills. She's really using the hands-on skills that she developed when she was studying. And she did English and French. So you can imagine how those subjects have really helped her to, to make her way in the world of work. Another example is Sean, who's working now uh, in publishing as a commissioning editor. And he's a great example of one of these students who really, as well as studying his English literature, really got stuck in and was involved writing for the university newspaper, the University Observer. And that's really helped him to develop skills that, that he can use actively in the world of work. Another example there is Aoife Smith, who works in a very contemporary uh, end of the of the communications industry uh, she works uh, with a collaborations agency um, she's a talent director that has to do with social media and influencing and she says she found her tribe I like the way she puts that she found her tribe when she was working editing the fashion pages in the university magazine so she found the people who she really feel felt she belonged with and to but also developed her skills um, these two are a sneak peek because we're going to get to actually meet uh, Daniel in person shortly, so I won't say too much more about him, and the same for Adisewa, who's here to talk to us this evening. So I gave you my reasons number three and number two, and now I want to give you my reason number one. And my reason number one is that you should simply study what you love. You must do what speaks to your heart. It's very, very important. Um, we've learned over the last few years that life can be really incredibly difficult and challenging. And in all of that, we really have to find our passion and follow it. It's incredibly important. Employers can train you to do things if they want you to do something specific. What they can't train is your passion and your enthusiasm. You need to bring that with you and you need to bring that with you into your studies as well. And if you do that, you'll make the world a better place for other people as, as well as for yourself. So I would always say study the subjects you love. And we have got a great selection. You can see there on the screen a list of the subjects that we offer as part of Arts and Humanities, really everything from linguistics through Latin, history, English film studies, drama studies. I think there's something for everybody to find their passion. So I'm going to kind of do a little pause now because I think we're going to share a small video with you so you get a chance to see what life looks like on our campus. I was always drawn to UCD. It was almost like a home away from home. I think what makes UCD unique is the sheer breadth of the opportunities provided for students. All of these opportunities to try new things, to meet new people, to go new places. I think the main attraction for me was the third year Erasmus to Spain. And now next I'm doing a journalism placement in British Vogue. The importance of an arts and humanities education cannot be underestimated. I've worked all over the world and really the expertise is unparalleled. Education in a way that's completely holistic. There's so many different types of students from all over the world and all over Ireland. You can meet people in your course, but you can meet people outside your course by hanging out in the social spaces. You're also so close to being able to go into the city. Dublin has an amazing cultural scene. You're never gonna get bored and you're never gonna stop meeting people. Get involved and run towards the things that you're scared of. Please, it would be the best thing you do. I think that was a great chance to see our campus. Um, it's a really great place to be. And um, despite everything that's been going on, we've all been on campus the last little while and, and things are going really, really, really well. I'm going to go back to my slideshow now because I just want to um, take two minutes more just to introduce you to our main programs before I hand back to Ema and we get to meet some of our current and former students. So um, there are three main programs that I want to talk to you about today and those are the BA Humanities Programme, the BA Joint Honours Programme and the BA International Modern Languages Programme. I'm going to start with Modern Languages first um, the Modern Languages Programme is a four-year programme, and that's clearly um, something for people who are really interested in developing expertise in languages, really developing their fluency 
You will in that program develop fluency in at least two languages, um, and you can choose from French, German, Italian, Spanish. Um, you can also do some Portuguese on the side, but the main languages are French, German, Italian, and Spanish. You can do um, all languages apart from French, from beginners. French, you need to have some uh, already from, from school or from previous learning. And um, in that program, there's a built-in year abroad. You're going to spend a whole year abroad at a host institution. So some students will study two languages on that program. Some students will even study three languages on that program. And obviously that's a great gateway to any international careers. That's particularly important at the moment, I would say in the wake of Brexit, um, when Ireland is the main representative of English speaking countries in Europe, but also obviously Irish um, uh, as a national language, working language of the European Union. There are a lot of job opportunities at the moment for people who have um, English or Irish plus another two languages. So this could be a really interesting option for many of you. Um, the other course I want to talk to you about is the BA Joint Honours, and that's our classic two subject um, BA degree. And it's a three year program in the first instance. You choose three subjects in your first year. And then at the end of the first year, you decide which subjects you want to take forward. So that's a really good program. If you kind of want to try out a new subject, you're not quite sure because it gives you the flexibility to change um, at the end of your first year and to move forward with something else. If you try out linguistics, let's say for the first time and you think this is great, this is for me, then you can take that forward in your second year. You can go on a year abroad as part of the BA program and if you do that then your degree degree becomes a BA international so that's a great choice I think a classic choice especially for people who want to go on afterwards and do postgrad study your three years prepares you very nicely for that the last program I want to um, show you here is the BA humanities program which is a four-year program and in that program we've got a choice of pathways and you can see them listed in front of you there some of the pathways are single subject, English literature, history, and Irish studies. And um, the other pathways are very carefully curated combinations of subjects that go nicely together. So they're interdisciplinary in nature, for example, classics, art history, archeology. span And this program really allows you um, to explore the connections between these different subjects. So that's, that's very, very exciting. Many of those programs have dedicated modules where the students all sit together, study together, and, and they explore the connections between the different areas in the program. Um, so that is a good program if you know that you're really interested in a particular field or fields and you want to do that from the start. And it's a four year program, so that gives you a bit of extra time to explore other avenues. And that means, for example, a semester abroad or a year abroad. And it also means an internship there's an option to do a semester internship in your third year of that program. Um, there are competitive internships available through the college and you can also self-source. And that's just really exciting to see students, even in the deepest, darkest depths of COVID, students were still going out on internships to museums, to cultural institutions, to businesses. Some students even um, sourced uh, some internships abroad um, in Germany, in Spain, in various different countries. So it's a really, really exciting, exciting new program with lots of options. If you are interested in studying languages, I would say heartily recommend you to come along next week to another talk, which is taking place on the 27th of January, at six o'clock. And that will really be looking in more depth at the programs that we offer with languages. And there are quite a few programs on offer in UCD that take languages as a dedicated part. So I can encourage you to come along because that will be very interesting for you. Also, I would just say to check out our guides. We have lots of um, guides to our various different individual schools where you can meet some of the people from the schools and they are up on YouTube. And I think that Katie will be putting some links into the chat for you so that you can see those and you can look at those at your leisure. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Gillian, and good evening, everybody. I hope you're all well out there. I'm going to invite Jacob Murphy to join us now and Noura Alharmoudi, if you guys could put your cameras on.
Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start by asking you, Nora, to introduce yourself and then Jacob, if you could introduce yourself after Nora. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nora. I am a fourth year UCD student and I'm studying classics, English and history. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacob. I'm also a fourth year student and I'm also studying classics, art, history and archaeology. So could we start this short Q&A session by just asking you about that jump between uh, secondary school and UCD? Can you tell us a little bit about how you settled into UCD? Nora, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, it was quite a jump because alongside that big transition of going to secondary school, it's like a whole new kind of world. Um, there was also the whole idea of like moving countries as well, which that in itself is kind of a bit you know, <laughs> intimidating. But I think in general, um, it's very intimidating, but you get the hang of it very quickly, um, especially with, because when you come to UCD, you, they prep you well, like you have, especially the um, peer mentor. And that especially is so important because you get to know exactly campus in, in and out. And you, you are like kind of matched with a peer mentor that can help you throughout the years or even years as well, like multiple years. And um, and you have all the resources that you need as well, like on campus. So it's not as intimidating as it seems. That's all I can say. It's quite simple. And how was it for you, da for you, Jacob? Um, well, it wasn't as daunting for me. I didn't have to, you know, move countries as Nora did. But um, I suppose it's the same as just going to secondary school from primary school. It's it's daunting at first, but eventually you do get the hang of it. And there is peer mentors to help you out. I, in fact, I'm a peer mentor, so I can say from experience with my own first years that they really do benefit from just having a friendly face and someone to talk to on your first day. But I suppose it's human nature going into a new place, meeting new people, doing different things than you would in secondary school. So you will be scared. But um, I promise, like after the first week or even after the first few hours, you'll be perfectly fine going into college. That's great to hear. And can you talk us a little bit about your, your course, Jacob? What's it like? Um, well, I'm doing classics, art, history and archaeology. And um, as you've said before, it's a multidisciplinary course. And it's really interesting. I mean, I've always had an interest in archaeology. And, you know, when you ask an archaeologist, what's the, why did you get into archaeology? The taboo word is Indiana Jones. But unfortunately, that is why I got into archaeology. But um, yeah, there's there's so many modules to choose from, and it's just a really interesting course. I mean, you start off with art history, you learn about paintings, you learn about the people who did them, like the social impact of those artists. And then you go on to archaeology and you learn kind of the same thing, the social impact of like artifacts, ancient civilizations and their histories. And they sort of coalesce together as one thing. And that's like the most interesting part of that pathway. And I do agree with the whole thing of like study what you love, because if you go into college and you pick something you don't like, you know, you're not really going to have a good time. It's like if you hate maths and you go into college to study maths, you mean it's common sense that you won't enjoy it. But um, it's been an interesting experience and proves to still be an interesting experience. And the assessments, you, you get the hang of them pretty quick. They're kind of like essays you would do in secondary school, except just with a lot more steps involved and a lot more study. But I suppose that's all I can really say is just pick what you enjoy and what I'm doing right now, I enjoy to its fullest. So yeah, that's all I can that's think of right now. That's great advice, Jacob. And we have a question here from Mila. How are you doing, Mila? He uh, is wondering, uh, does archaeology involve a lot of practical work? Um, I suppose it does. In your third year, you can elect to do, um, I can't think of the name for it, but it's basically you go outdoors and you're tasked with like um, building something in our experimental archaeology center, which is a field where we build like um, houses from like medieval ages and like different tools. In fact, in my third year, we actually were tasked with building arrows in like the ancient style. So you'd have to get a rock, you have to get a sharper rock, like flint, I think, and actually make an arrowhead. You have to make the, like the mortar to put into the arrow, into the shaft. And we actually, they're actually still buried up in the experimental center at the moment. So yeah, you definitely do get to do um, practical work. And in my third year, we um, we went to Greece, although it was in the summer and me being Irish, it didn't last long. I actually got heat stroke, so I had to come back. But while I was there, um, we had a great time. We got to see temples, they explained it. We got to see excavation sites. So yeah, you definitely do get to do a lot of practical work. Maybe not so much in your first year because you're settling in, but as you progress along, yeah, definitely. That's great. Thank you for that, Jacob. And sounds like uh, you've had 
great fun, very interactive things happening on your course. How about yeah. Nora? How is your course? How are you? Um, yeah, well, okay. So when I wanted to apply, I actually didn't know I was going to originally going to go in with just English literature, but then I saw, you know, this and classics, English and history, and it's like everything you want in one. And you do uh, multiple modules in English, multiple modules in history, and multiple modules in classics, and some of them kind of overlap as well, which makes it fun. It's not as hands on as archaeology because it's primarily just like, you know, uh, books and reading and, you know, in class. But they are the occasional um, trips to special collections, which is like um, a place in UCD actually where you have like all these like ancient texts that are preserved and you have to go in and you have to wear these like fancy gloves and look at them and stuff and there's also the um uh national folklore collection at UCD as well they can you can go and visit and look at them so um it's not as very hands-on as archaeology but it's still just as fun I like to say. And Nora what does a week look like for you between lectures and tutorials and, and different things? Oh, it's not as intense. It's definitely much easier than waking up at 6 or 7 a.m. for school. Um, you have obviously the freedom of choosing your tutorials. So you can, you know, and they vary. Like you can have them at 9 a.m. if you want, but you can also have tutorials from 6 to 8 p.m. even if that's what you're in, like if that's what you prefer. Um, it's quite, it's not as intense as it seems. Um, as you progress um, and you start doing, for example, 10 credit modules, your timetable will look a little more sparse, but that's just because um, instead of five credits, which is like first and second year, primarily you're doing more kind of intensive work, but that I swear, like, it's not, that's not scary at all. Not daunting because the, you, you do prepare for it. It's not suddenly you're just like the workload is like tenfold. So, yeah. And can you talk to us a little bit outside of the classroom for people who haven't been on the UCD campus before or in recent times, what's it like? What are the societies like? What is the vibe? Jacob, you might like to take that question first. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I suppose the one thing you would notice when you go on to UCD campus is it's really big. I mean, it's really, really big. It's almost like a town in and of itself. But um, I suppose like, look at it this way. When you went to, into secondary school, that looked big. It looked really complicated. And, you know, you're kind of panicking, like, what classes, like, where do I go? And that's the exact same thing with um, college. You just go in, you get to know the layout of the place. And there's, like, so many different and interesting things to do in college. In fact, I think by the science building, there's a giant chess set where I do see people, like, literally lifting, like, gigantic pieces of, like, chess and, like, playing. But um, it's really well laid out. I mean, like there's the massive lake with the swans and uh, if memory serves, I think the swans are actually named after the Kardashian family. And um, yeah, there's like there's shops around campus. So if you ever feel hungry or need a coffee or even if you need to buy stationery, you can go into any one of them and purchase anything. There's also the Locust Campus bookstore. That's good. There's also a gym with like, I think, an Olympic sized swimming pool. So if you fancy a bit of swimming, you can do that, too. And of course, there's the main attraction of the campus, which is the library. And um, I usually spend like a considerable amount of time in the library when I can. And uh, even with COVID, it, even though like there's like less seats, if you play your cards right, you could probably get a booking in as fast as you can. But um, the campus, it is big, but you do get the hang of it. And um, you'll be flying it within a week or two of college. Trust me, you will be. Thank you, Jacob. And Nora, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your favorite societies in UCD? Yeah, so there's pretty much generally like a society for almost everything. Um, there's a food society, there's Arab society, there's a film, there's game, there's uh, one of my favorites, Belfield FM, which is kind of the radio society. And if you join that, you can kind of have like your own radio show, like a genuine, you have a, we have like a proper pod in the student center and you can see this like big, like yellow kind of little hot I guess I don't know and you go in and you have all these machines and like the headphones and everything and the panels and yeah, you literally have a radio show and you can have people call in and like a proper proper radio show and then you have the film sock when they play like two movies I believe every week and they have coffee mornings as well for example and if you need to sign up they're free to go in as long as you just I think paid like the entry fee of two euro I think for every society and it's free you go in and sometimes they give you free popcorn and free and a free drink and yeah, um, yeah, there's genuinely society for almost everything. There's also the Harry Potter sock, which is really popular. And they do a bunch of fun things in that as well. And there's also like London trips, trips abroad within societies. So definitely like societies are a way to go if you definitely want to like have the full college experience. 
that sounds like fun. We have a question related to that, I think, in from the Czech Republic from Jakub. Jakub, how are you doing? And lovely to hear. We have people joining us from the Czech Republic. He's interested in knowing, as an international student, is it easy to make friends and become part of the community, Nora? Oh, no, absolutely. Like, I'm not even just sugarcoating this 100%. Um, I was so scared when I first came because obviously it's like a whole new world, you know. But um, I think the first thing, definitely put, don't be scared to put yourself out there. That does sound daunting. So join societies, do like, because then you find automatically people that are interested in the same things as you are. And that kind of makes the initial like first step making friends all that, all, all the more easier. And then you also have the peer mentor groups. And those, you're, the groups that you're in are those that are generally on your major as well. So, and generally uh, my closest friends today are those that I was with in my peer mentor group. So don't worry about that at all. And you also have the global lounge. There is a global lounge here as well where a lot of international students can go and you can uh, chill there. There's this huge screen. You can go down there and like, they used to, like have uh, game nights and movie nights as well. So don't worry about that at all. Okay, that's great. So we're going to move on very shortly to speak with uh, Danny and Adesua, who are uh, graduates from UCD. But I just wanted to ask you both one final uh, piece, which is going back a few years when you were applying for UCD, what advice would you give to yourself, knowing what you know now, to your 17 or your 18 year old self? Jacob? Well, I suppose the advice I give myself is just, just don't sweat it, take your time. And um, well, I commute up and down every day from college. So I suppose the biggest bit of advice I'd get um, would be to have a proper sleep schedule because you don't want to go into college. I mean, after spending like hours up all night and just going in completely dead. But um, yeah, just take your time, take it nice and slow. Really think about what you want to do. Um, so like if you're looking at your CAO and you're kind of like iffy on like what you want to do, my advice would be to just either take a long walk or just do something else to get your mind off it for a few hours, then come back to it fresh and then like make an informed decision. That's what I do with assignments. Like if I get a choice of an assignment I want to do, I kind of like look at the pros and cons of each one. And that's really what you have to do for college as well. It's really just down to your work ethic. But yeah, just take it nice and slow and you'll be grand. That is fantastic advice, Jacob. Nora, what about you? I would honestly just say take a deep breath. It'll work out. Like genuinely, it'll all, it'll all work out, like you're fine. I think on that note, we'll all take a very mindful deep breath. Uh, <laughs> I, we'll come back to Jacob and Nora at the end because we are going to do some questions for everybody who's gathered on this call. So please do send in your questions and we'll take all your questions at the end. Now is the time to start typing on those dials. Um, so thank you, Nora and Jacob, for now. We'll bring you back in at the end. But next, we might move on to Adesua and to Danny. If we could bring you into the frame. Hello, Adesua and Danny. Hello. You're very welcome back to UCD virtually. We'd love uh, to be having you back on campus, uh, but unfortunately that's not possible right now. Hopefully soon in the future, we'll be able to welcome prospecting students onto the campus. But for now, it's Zoom all the way. So I'd like to maybe start by uh, uh, inviting you to introduce yourselves and tell us what you're doing now. We'll start with you, Adesua. Hi everyone, um, so I studied English and Linguistics in UCD and at the moment I'm currently working as an entry level journalist with the Irish Times. And Danny? Hi everyone, um, so yeah, my name is Danny Kearns. I work in the civil service. Uh, I'm actually an assistant principal officer now and I'm currently working in the international cooperation section. Um, so it, it it means engaging with a lot of European colleagues on policy level uh, issues. So it's, it's quite an interesting. And I studied classical studies at master's level and did an undergraduate degree in history and Greek and Roman civilization. Thank you both very much. So I might just start a little bit of trip down memory lane, a bit of nostalgia. Uh, what were the highlights of your time at UCD? Adesua. Um, I think for me, one of the highlights um, was definitely just society. Um, as the guy said earlier on, um, just getting involved in society really does make a difference um, to your time at university. For example, um, I joined the University Observer as a writer for them, and that really helps me, um, I guess, in my career, and also just developing skills and meeting new people. Um, so that was definitely one of my biggest highlights. Another one actually was, um, I actually did an Erasmus, I went to Freiburg in Germany um, as part of my joint bachelor's course. Um, so that was really, really nice because I got the experience to go out 
and just experience a whole new um, culture, which was amazing. And again, just really, really, really was a massive highlight to my time in UCD. It sounds fantastic. And Danny, what about you? Uh, I definitely have to echo the, the call to, to say societies are really a huge opportunity and particularly because you, you have societies that tend to focus on subjects and areas of interest so you'll have things like the classic society English lit society and they're really great and then you've kind of more hobby driven societies and I definitely you know dabble in both uh, I was very active in the game society but also the classic society um, and then as well I, I think UCD has a lot of great resources and it's for example the UCD classics museum and I know the the, the, the collection of the library has been mentioned as well but but there's a lot of things on campus and kind of hidden away so do take the time to explore it um but you but yeah most definitely spending time in the museum which i had opportunities to do as part of classes really hugely memorable that's great uh, we're going to talk a little bit about skills now because a lot of people on the call now they're thinking you know about coming to ucd but they're also thinking about life after ucd and the kind of skills that they're going to develop and learn while they're here danny i might ask you um you know it's a, quite a few years now since you graduated you've had a few years in the working world can you tell us a little bit about the kind of skills and the the edge that you feel you have against maybe graduates who didn't study arts and humanities yeah, well, uh, one thing I'd like to just start out by saying is that an arts and humanities degree really doesn't pigeonhole you and, and don't think that you can't go into industries. Um, like when I graduated, I actually went and worked as a fund accountant in Irish life at first. So I actually jumped into the finance industry uh, and you're there working with people who studied accountancy and finance and you're there as an arts and humanities degree. And you can see the different perspective you bring in the way you think about problems and approach kind of creative, like driving solutions to those problems um so, so don't be afraid about what kind of career you can do if you decide at a later date you want to go work in in those kind of fields you definitely will have those opportunities um i definitely think the the, the key skill for arts and humanities and, and the biggest one that you come across is the ability to synthesize information and look at complex problems and really being able to explain them in a relatively simple manner and, and that's something that comes across a huge amount of my job is when you're trying to explain huge system-wide issues and understand knock-on impacts and break them down to something relatively simple that you can explain to either the public or, or or in my case often government ministers so that they can understand it when they have so much else on their plate so i, I really think there's a huge amount to learn there from, from arts and humanities degrees that's great and adesua what about you you're writing in the irish times now can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing how did you land an internship in the irish times and what sort of skills do you think helped you get in the door, as they say? Um, yeah, two massive skills that I think definitely helped were just um, creativity, um, just in terms of just maybe cover letter and CV, and also just persuasiveness. Um, I think that was the skill that was mentioned earlier on. But um, yeah, so I'm actually, sorry about the background noise, um, but yeah, I'm actually, um, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, I think the persuasiveness really, really helped just because um, with journalism, you have to be able to, as Danny said, convey, convey a point and do it, um, I guess, in simple ways, but also sometimes synthesizing um, crazy concepts and crazy information, but also writing it in a way that's engaging to readers. So I think that's where the creativity comes in for me. Um, so yeah, those are two massive skills. Um, Perhaps. That's great. And you graduated last year and went straight into the Irish Times. How did that feel? That did. felt. Yeah. Um, one thing as well that I would say definitely, definitely helped was just um, in my time in UCD, I think it helped gain, it helped me gain a lot of confidence um, just from simple activities, just like group projects and presentations. Um, so I think that definitely played a part because um, everybody knows that job searching can be a bit daunting and it's not easy, but I think one of the things is that you have to put yourself out there and just be confident with your skills, with what you have, and also just in your abilities. And I think um, my arts and humanities course definitely helped me to just be confident and just, again, put myself out there, which was, I think, one of the reasons why I actually landed this role, um, which I am grateful for. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Danny, any advice for the students on this call? So casting your mind back, when you were filling out your CAA, I'm thinking about your application for university. What words of wisdom do you have? The, the big thing, uh, and I know this has been touched on already, is, is definitely study what you find interesting. 
um, and, and what you really want to study. Don't be concerned about, will I find a job in the future? Will I? So many employers are, are focused on those kind of transversal skills that you pick up and you will pick up in an arts and humanities degree. And, and, and to say, like, I, I'm a real, and I say this to everyone who's looking for the CAO, I actually applied for something that based that on what I thought would get me a job and ended up dropping out and coming back and studying in UCD after. So I, I learned the hard way from that mistake. So, so definitely d don't listen to other people saying, oh, will you find work with, would you not go do something else? Honestly, study what you find interesting. If your passion is English, if your passion is history, if it's French, it doesn't matter what it is, that's what you should study. Okay, great advice, Danny. And you, Adesua, any words of um, Yes, I would say utilize the, um, the facilities that are available to you. So you have so, so many facilities. Um, I actually, I worked a bit with the career um, center in UCD and I think that really, really helped. They also have um, just so many things in place that a lot of people are not aware of, but there's so many um, facilities there that's able to help people. And the same thing Danny said, I would literally say, um, just do what you like. Um, again, don't worry, take it from me. Um, just do whatever it is you like and it will work out. Um, and I would also say just explore. Um, one thing about my time in UCD was that it was such a time of exploration is because I came in in a joint um, joint honours, so I had the opportunity to do, to do three subjects in my first year. Um, so those were English, drama and linguistics. And I actually didn't hear, I had, I'd, I'd never heard about linguistics before, um, but I just decided to try it out and it's actually my degree now. So I would say explore, exploring societies, explore even within your courses, within um, electives, just explore, do what you like, and everything will work out. So yeah, that's my advice. I'd actually, just to come back in there, I think Adesua makes a really good point, and it's something I was thinking about earlier. One advantage of UCD is the fact that everything is on campus in, in that kind of one site. Other third level institutions don't have that. So you actually have a great opportunity to meet people studying other degrees and other courses and get kind of that interdisciplinary insight into things. And, and that's a really useful insight. And one thing I'd also say, because I'm still in contact with a few, make friends with international students that kind of cross-cultural learning is so important uh, and you really learn so many lessons and it's something that UCD has a lot of and there's a lot to gain there for people. Okay so Danny and Adesua stay with us and if Jacob and Nora and Gillian would like to come back into the call because we're going to close out quite soon and this is your last chance to send through any questions uh, or queries that you have. Uh, I see a, a really interesting question here from Lucy Coleman Lucy, how are you doing? She previously was in general nursing and uh, is has decided to change course. And she's wondering, do we have any advice for her returning to college and potentially starting over? Gillian, I might ask you to take that fabulous question because I think it's a very common um, reality and occurrence in people's lives. Yes, and it, it, it uh, thanks for the question, uh, Lucy. That does relate to a que another question that popped up earlier on about mature students as well and about the welcome that they receive on campus. I think that our student body is increasingly diverse and I see mature students, um, people who've done other things and then they're coming back to college all the time. And um, it seems to me, looking at the results that they do very well, first of all, despite sometimes their anxieties about coming back to college after being away for a while. So I think that should, should reassure you, first of all, that your life experience that you bring with you is really, really valuable to bring that into the classroom is a really great thing. It's great for us as well as it is for you. So that's important. Um, there are quite a lot of supports um, for learning. So we have a writing center, for example, where you can go and get support with writing essays um, or a math centre if you're coming in to do a maths based uh, subject. Um, there are um, our um, Access and Lifelong Learning Centre is fantastic in terms of offering you support with things like digital technologies. There's a lot of training and support available out there. So I think if you're nervous about a particular aspect, there's usually some help to be found. And of course, a lot of help to be found from working with other students as well on projects and things. I think that's a very supportive environment. So I hope that the return to college is gonna be um, an exciting one for you and, and not as daunting as you think. Gillian, can students doing the humanities choose elective modules as well? Yes, 
um, choosing elective modules is part of the, the general system that we have in UCD across the whole of the university. Um, the principle is that you can choose an elective um, subject or elective modules. Um, you can start to do that in the second semester of your first year, you can choose one, and then in your second year, third year, you can get, you can choose up to two. You can use those elective modules to do more in the subjects you're interested in, or you can use them to try out something completely new, whether that's food and nutrition or discovering something completely different, forestry, whatever it is you're interested in. Thank you. And um, we're calling in California now. Hello, Leighton in California. He's wondering, is it possible for non-EU students to study abroad or is there a visa problem with that? That's a difficult question to answer uh, with a blanket answer because it will depend on 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 the nationality and then the, the host country. But certainly, um, I have worked a lot with Modern Languages program, and we frequently have US students who then do go and spend a year abroad, for example, in France, countries like that. So that's something that we need to check out depending on the nationality. But it certainly happens. Yes. And if we're talking US EU, is that a straightforward transaction? Um, front. That I'm, I don't want to exceed my remit okay. because I'm not an immigration officer, but no I do. But I do know. But can, I do certainly. We have we have had on the modern language students uh, a program. U.S. students who were international students coming from the U.S. and they went out to France for a year abroad and to Germany as well. So it okay, certainly is possible. Right. Yeah. Well, we can get back to uh, to California about that just to confirm either way. We'll make a note of that. Um, and another really good question from Laura, uh, which would apply not just to English, which is the subject she's asking about, but to a lot of the subjects that students are studying at school. What is the main difference between studying, for example, English or history at school and then at university? Is there a way to um, to describe that? Uh, maybe Gillian, we can ask you first and then Adesua, because you studied uh, English as part of the joint honours. And I'm going to be really interested to hear what Adesua has to say about it as well, but I would say that I think the main difference is that you uh, at university, we encourage students to to research, to think about questions and to go away and to research them for themselves and to put together an argument. I think that learning to put together an argument for yourself using the sources that you reputable sources that you find in the library and elsewhere. Um, that is the crucial difference. So you're not really being told this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. You're actually given a lot more freedom to build an argument and, and to, to, to do that independently and to do that in your own time. So you need to get good at organizing yourself. And I think that's the sort of key difference, but I'm sure I say we'll have more things to say about that. Yeah, I think you know that to be honest, um, just a lot of independent thinking. I think from school, we're kind of taught how to think in a way that's like, oh, you know, we've studied this, this is probably what we can, because you all kind of do it collectively, whereas in university, it's pretty much just like, go away, think, come back, write an essay. Um, but one thing that I would say is quite different as well is that um, you really need to know how to, it really teaches you how to communicate um, and how to argue, because like, Whatever your perspective is, whatever you think, you just have to get that across, um, which can be challenging, but it's also really nice. But I would say that's the difference I found anyway. Danny, do you have any reflections based on the subjects you studied, the difference between school and uh, university level? I, I definitely think like the depth of treatment uh, that, that you approach them is is significantly different. And I, and I think that comes down to the research piece and, and the own the research that you're carried, carrying out yourself and the way in, in order, like, and particularly if you move on to postgraduate level, you start like your lectures are starting to look to elicit your own opinion on things and have that kind of extra level of thought. Um, that's great. Thank you, Danny. I see Hannah is asking about the new BA in creative and cultural industries. I'm wondering, are there going to be any more courses added this year? And I'll answer that straight out. There's no more courses added this year. The new addition this year is the uh, creative and uh, cultural industries. I might call on you, Nora, to answer this question. Um, uh, I don't have a name with this question, but what does a first day at UCD look like? And do first years uh, start before other years? Um, uh, could you take that, Nora? Yeah. Um, 
I do know that first years do start different time. I don't remember if it's before or after. I believe it's one week after if I'm not wrong. Um, so you definitely have time to settle in. It depends if you consider your first day being peer mentor day or if your first day is like an actual first day when you stick to your timetable. But let's say it's the timetable one. Um, automatically, it's, it differs for everyone. It depends on timetable when you're in. But if you will first meet um, your lecturers and automatically they'll just introduce the course. They're so lovely, genuinely. They make you feel so welcome. And um, they set, let everything like straight up, uh, this is what we're gonna study. These are the assignments and you know dates and everything on it. And it's generally very easygoing. It's, you don't really get like into it on, like from the get-go. So they easily, you get eased into it. Okay, that's great. I see a question here about how many students are there in the Global Studies course. And I think it's around 20 to 25 uh, is the number for the past few years, um, and that's growing. So it could be up as high as 30 or 35 uh, next year. But it's uh, a lot of the humanities courses are in around the 20, 30 students. So they're nice um, uh, manageable small classes where everybody gets to know each other very, very well. Um, I see there's a question here from an Italian student, Buongiorno, who is wondering about applying to UCD for 2023. Gillian, could you give some advice there? Applying for 2023. That is correct. So that would be the CEO of next year, am I right in thinking that? So it'd be about February of 2023. Indeed, yes. So that would be the deadline next next February so there's a good bit of time to be thinking about it and exploring um and then I don't know otherwise what the question exactly entails just is it about deadlines or it's just about deadlines and applying so it's through the website cao.ie and your deadline would be February uh, the first of 2023 yeah I would just say as well, I mean, this is sort of slightly off topic, but I think it's really important to know that if you're thinking, and obviously um, our uh, prospective student in Italy has lots of time, um, I think it's really worth getting in touch with um, a school. So if you're really interested in a particular subject, if you're interested in coming to study German, for example, I'm only delighted to, to hear from you. Um, I really like that when I get an email from a student asking me questions. So I think if you're taking your time to research and to think, might I like to go to UCD, do get in touch with people in the specific schools and they will answer your questions. And if you're here, you can drop in and say hello once the campus is, is fully back to normal again. Great advice. Mm -hmm. And one for you, Danny, if I may. Uh, how did you navigate a job? How did you land a job in a sector where at surface level you it was unrelated to your degree? Yeah, I, I do get this question a lot. Um, the, the honest answer in terms of how I landed the job was I was looking for work and just kind of throwing my CV out there. Um, but, uh, you know, I ended up with interviews for a couple of different places, like like I had one at KPMG as well. Um, and And to be honest, a lot of these companies like ultimately they have their own specific processes that aren't necessarily something that someone is going to learn in a business degree or finance degree and they're willing to train people up and, and like I said uh, and to be overly honest when I went for this job in Irish life you did have to do a, a, a maths aptitude test but everyone did it wasn't specifically because I didn't have a finance degree or something um, and I, I say the big thing is a willingness to constantly upscale yourself and learn that specialist knowledge but, but most of the companies that are hiring people from kind of broad graduate pools they you know they know these people aren't going to come in with specialist knowledge but they're really looking for people with the skill sets and have shown that they can apply themselves to complete a university degree okay that's great great advice there and um, and i see here we have a, a question about is there any way to access sample lectures so i probably the best thing to do is to come along to the summer school or to look up the summer school lectures on our YouTube channel, which is uh, the link has been posted in the chat um, from last June, or if you can come along in June, it's usually just after the bank holiday. Gillian, is there any other way for students to come along and sample lectures? Well, there are sometimes, I mean, obviously under COVID things are a little bit different. There are sometimes schemes whereby students can come and shadow. Um, those are suspended at the moment. So I do think the summer school is a really good way to, to do that. Um, I have in the past pre-COVID times hosted an interested student who's wanted to pop in and, and, and come and listen to what we do. That's 
that's not a problem in the general scheme of things but at the moment that would not that would not work so i think the summer school is the best option okay so i think mm -hmm. we pretty much made it through all of the questions i'd just like to take this chance to thank everybody for coming along for to adesua and to danny for coming back to ucd we love having our graduates back and to nora and jacob for taking time out of your schedule uh, and to Gillian for that really great, insightful presentation and to Katie, who has been working behind the scenes, pasting in all the link and answering your questions. So big thanks to everybody. Uh, I encourage you to stay in touch and um, keep in touch with us through our social media channels, through our YouTube and through email. We're here to help you. We're here to answer your questions. Um, and really, we just want to wish you all the best of luck with this application uh, with the CAO and those who are applying internationally. Um, I'd love to leave the closing word to you, Gillian. Thanks very much. Well, I just want to wish everybody the best of luck with everything. I want to thank all the students and former students who came in to talk to us today and just to wish everybody the best of luck with their applications. Follow your heart, do what you love and all the best with, with your exams and your other various preparations. And thank you for coming along this evening.